Did you know that the genus Talansia or air plants only bloom once in their entire life? And if you look closely, they have little hairs, sometimes they look like crystals, that are called trichomes. They're visible on some species more than others. This one is super hairy. But what's cool is when the bloom cycle is finished, it'll start to grow new pups on the side of the plant. It's basically a propagation and the entire cycle starts again. Do you have any air plants? I work with house plants for a living and just by looking at a plant, I can tell almost exactly the soil mix it needs. And I'll show you how. When you go to the store, you'll find regular soil and cactus soil. The main difference between them is the drainage aid. A cactus soil has much more of a drainage aid, as you can see here, and a regular potting soil is much more dense. Depending on how long a plant retains water determines how much drainage aid you need in the soil. In general, if a plant has really thick leaves like this, it needs more drainage aid because it retains water for a long time. The thinner the leaf, the less drainage aid you need. Think of it like choosing between a heavy or light moisturizer for your skin. Once you've got the perfect mix, it's on to repotting, which I'll help you with next. Here are my top favorite seven plancy items that you need. Velcro brand gardening tape. This stuff is amazing. It's what I use to tie up any of my plants that I have on a trellis or a pole, and I literally have nothing but good things to say about this. Miracle Grow Leaf Shine. I've tried so many different things to try to get my leaves shiny, and this stuff is the best. Super Thrive. I feel like this is a staple in most plant parents' watering routine, and for a good reason. Plant Clips. These are 3M brand, and I use them to help with my climbing plants. Atrian Neem Oil. This is the best smelling neem oil on the market, I swear. <laughs> fungus nut traps. These help significantly when you have fungus nut infestations. Last but not least, an indoor potting mat. These make potting indoors so much easier. All these items will be linked on my Amazon storefront if you want to check them out. This is day 9 of 30 of my Beginner Plant Parent tip series. Follow along for more. Why is it that some plants are silver or iridescent and does it actually help the plant in any way? Hi, I'm Quinn. Welcome to Plant Talk. This type of variegation is called blister or reflective variegation. Blister variegation like we see in the Scandapsis pictus varieties is actually caused by a layer of air trapped between a translucent epidermal layer on top and a non-translucent dermal layer on bottom, which is where we'll find the chloroplast. Just like blister variegation, reflective or iridescent variegation is actually a low light adaptation. While at first we might think that this type of variegation is acting as a type of sunscreen to bounce sun rays off, it's actually helping the sun to focus light energy into its chloroplasts. Like magnifying glass can localize sun rays. Hey guys, welcome back to Plant Talk. It's time to get freaky. Nah, that was weird. Let's talk about inflorescence. Aeroids actually flower. It just looks a little bit different than what you're used to. Just like regular flowers, your aeroids use their inflorescence to create seeds. Well, it creates a fruit and then there's a seed inside. This is kind of what they look like when they grow in. Aeroids typically have unisex inflorescence, which means this is female now, but in a couple of days, it'll change to a male. Right now, it just kind of has a sticky residue on it, no pollen. Once the pollen does form, I'm gonna use a paintbrush to get it off, I'm gonna freeze it, and then once my Maharani blooms, I'm gonna put it on the female inflorescent. And same with my Crystallinum. When this one blooms, I'm gonna save the pollen and put it with my Magnificum. So follow along and see what happens. Y'all know what it is. Peace Lily repotting. My Peace Lily was real thirsty like y'all husband's hooky trying to talk to me. <laughs> Took some stair lashes and gave my girl a quick little haircut. Checked her root ball and found that it was thick. Th -th 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 thick in new growth. Gently pulled those roots apart so that they could settle themselves around the new soil and help her grow. Grabbed a two inches bigger terracotta pot that I soaked overnight so that it won't steal my girl's water when I repot her in it. Got some well drained soil because it's in a spangum peat moss, perlite, and composting pine bark. Settled my girl in a new home. Added more soil, leaving one inch at the top for watering, and made sure I secured her wig by patting it in tightly, leaving no air pockets. Added some mosquito bits to the soil to keep those fungus gnats away. Click the link in my bio to purchase this from my Amazon store under pest control. Water her with filter water that's been sitting for days to remove salt builds up. Water her into the water drip from the bottom hole. Added some pebbles to her tray because my girl likes to stay moist. Sprayed her foliage and soil with neem oil to keep other plant pests away. And boom, my girl ain't crying over that cheating husband no more. Follow for are spider plants toxic for your cat? I mean, well, kind of, but not like deadly toxic, but well, I'll just tell you the story so far. When we say they're kind of toxic, it's because they're kind of hallucinogenic. But like, you know how catnip is kind of hallucinogenic? Similar to opium. Spider plants contain an organic molecule called saponin. For you chemistry buffs, this molecule is both polar and non-polar, just like me. Bing. Is it mildly hallucinogenic to humans? No. So what's it doing in there? I don't know. This tasty morsel your cat's gonna love. So is it toxic? Yes. Is it toxic? No. But it's not gonna kill your cat, but it's gonna kill your plant. Five plants
place in my collection that you need in yours. A mandula pothos, a serious Peruvian cactus, a strawberry cream syngonium, a variegated elephant ear, and a philodendron brandy. I just got this lovely yucca. It's so big, I hope it doesn't get stucca. This is called yucca gigantia because it's big. Also called the spineless yucca. Ooh. It's native to Central America and Mexico, and it produces edible flowers which are used in Salvadorian cuisine. Um, it's also the national flower of El Salvador. If I treat it nicely, maybe it'll flower for me and I can, can eat its flowers. Here's my full rundown on how I prevent pests. Over the years, I've gotten spider mites, thrips, mealybugs, scale, fungus gnats, you name it. But no issues in the last couple years because I really stepped up my prevention. First of all, I quarantine every new plant for about two weeks, especially if it came from a nursery. It's also really important to make sure your plants have adequate sunlight and airflow and that they're not overwatered. Now here's the part where most people hesitate. Folks are understandably wary of using chemicals, but the thing to keep in mind is that these are not edible plants, these are all ornamentals, and this is going to save you a lot of heartache in the long run. The first product I use is Captain Jack's Dead Bug Spray. I spray everything down with this about twice a year or at the first sign of anything. This product is organic and this is used on all your organic produce that you eat. I make tea with mosquito bits and water the plants with this to prevent fungus gnats. I use copper fungicide on my begonias to prevent powdery mildew. And lastly, I mix bonide systemic granules into all my soil and I'll refresh that about twice a year. Most people kill their plants over the winter because they stick to a rigid watering schedule year round. Fewer hours of sunlight means your plant will absorb water much slower, which leads to wetter soil for longer, which leads to overwatered plants. But if you're blasting the heat near your house plants, they'll dry out much quicker. You can use your finger to test how wet your soil is, but unless you're salad fingers, you'll have no idea if your soil is soaking wet past the first two or three inches. Use a thin wooden dowel to test all the way to the bottom. Maybe success is watering for your soil and not your plants. Check out Kill This Plant for more. You think it's cool of you just to leave a comment in my video about a plant that has something special in it? This video is purely for botanical education purposes and by no means am I suggesting anything by this video. This is the San Pedro cactus or Echinopsis pachinoi. As we said before, this plant is completely legal to own. This cactus belongs to the family Cactaceae and subfamily Cactoideae. This particular type of cactus is called a totem cactus. At most nurseries, you'll find it like this, with multiple totems in each pot. Like other plants, there are also variegated forms. This cactus contains a proto-alkaloid called mescaline. Proto-alkaloids are organic molecules that are similar to alkaloids, except their nitrogen is found outside of their heterocyclic ring. This compound mainly affects the brain's right hemisphere. Side effects include visual, olfactory, and auditory hallucinations. Follow me, you'll learn plant things. How to keep your plants alive like a hot girl? Fungus gnats. Get these yellow sticky traps online to trap the adults that are flying around. Just swap them out every time they get filled with bugs and prevent them from laying eggs with one tablespoon Castile soap and one quart of water in a spray bottle. Just give that soil a good squirt. Did you know if you grab a blueberry and squash it, then plant it in a pot with soil, sprinkle some soil on top, lightly water it, then put a bottle on top for humidity, pretty soon it'll become a seedling. Plant it in a bigger pot and it'll grow into a blueberry bush. Grow some blueberries. 